Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Yes, please accept my humble obeisances. On Guru Sri Prabhupada. Jai, on Guru Sri Prabhupada. So, uh, how many people are in this group now? Maharaj, although there are 21 people, um, right now there are 11 people. So we are just waiting. We'll wait for a few more minutes, Maharaj, if you allow, for yeah. the rest of the students to lunch. Okay. Hi Krishna Maharaj. I think perhaps we are okay to begin now. Really? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare
So welcome everyone to our uh, first session in this new unit in your study of Bhakti Vai Bhav. So today we're scheduled to begin looking at the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Did you have a long break? Have you finished the first one quite some time back? Yes, Maharaji. Almost uh, three months back. Oh, you finished the first canto three months back. So you haven't had anything for three months. Uh, this, uh, our lecture series was going on, so everybody has a chance to present uh, on the different verses of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. So that part has been finished now. Let me see. Okay. And first canto also, basically, we begin with you only, Maharaji. Like first, uh, uh, first unit has been taught to us by you only, Maharaj. Really? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So here we are again. You're stuck with me again. Okay. So we have a. Uh, uh, let me see. Can do we have a? I have to share the screen here. You make I, I I want to share the screen, right? Share screen. Are you able to see the the screen? Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Oh, here's a quote for you. Oh. This is from Lord Shiva. <laughs> this is from the fourth canto. <laughs> anyway, you might like to read it. We put it here. It's in here from the fourth canto, telling us about the importance of the first two cantos. My dear Lord, your two lotus feet are so beautiful. Oh, goodness. That they appear like two blossoming petals of the lotus flower, which grows during the autumn season. Indeed, the nails of your lotus feet emanate such a great effulgence that they immediately dissipate all the darkness in the heart of a conditioned soul. My dear Lord, kindly show me that form of yours which always dissipates all kinds of darkness in the heart of a devotee. My dear Lord, you are the supreme spiritual master of everyone. Therefore, all conditioned souls covered with the darkness of ignorance can be enlightened by you as a spiritual master. So this is from the fourth canto of the song of Lord Shiva. Everyone serious about understanding the transcendental science and seeing the transcendental form of the Lord must first of all attempt to see the lotus feet of the Lord by studying the first and second cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. When one sees the lotus feet of the Lord, all kinds of doubts and fears within the heart are vanquished. From the fourth canto, chapter 24, text 52. All right. So the, the importance of the first two cantos. It's the lotus feet, the pada padma. And in order to see the, the lotus feet, the beautiful form of Lord Krishna, we have to first of all see the lotus feet of the Lord. So here's an overview of what you studied in the first canto. You remember, you've gone through the first canto, 19 chapters, right? So Sutta Goswami was welcomed in the first three chapters, like it was a, like an introduction. Sutta Goswami is welcomed by the sages, and that's all in Naimasharanya. And then chapters 4 to 6, we had Narada Muni 
talking to Srila Vyasadeva who had become despondent. He wasn't feeling the pleasure he thought he would be feeling. Then chapter 7 up to 16, we hear about the disappearance of many different personalities. First of all, there was a Bhishma departed from the world and Dhritarashtra left home. And then you had the Pandavas retiring timely. And then you had the, the fractal annihilation of the Vrishni dynasty. All the Vrishnis annihilated each other. And then Lord Krishna left the world. So all of this was described chapter 7 to 16. And at the end of that, then you had the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. And then you have the meeting of these two persons in the chapter 17 up to 19. So this first canto, it's, it's not Sukadeva Goswami speaking, it's Sutta Goswami. And Sutta Goswami speaks the first canto, and he won't speak again up until the 12th canto. At the end of the, at the first five chapters of the 12th canto are spoken by Sukadeva, and then Sutta Goswami speaks at the end, the second half of the 12th canto. So uh, Sutta Goswami is giving this first canto here, and then second canto we hear Sukadeva Goswami. So here's the overview of the second canto, what we're going to be looking at in the next couple of units. So the first three chapters, are called the, the three steps to God realization. We'll hear about realizing the impersonal aspect of the Lord and then focusing on the Paramatma and then Bhagavan. Right? The absolute truth is realized in three phases, Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. So three steps to God realization. First chapter is Brahman more. We'll be hearing more about the impersonal feature today. And then the second chapter is focusing on the Paramatma and the third chapter the Bhagavan. Then chapters four and five, you've got questions by Parikshit and then prayers by Sukadev. So questions by Parikshit. There's nothing much there, just some question, mainly questions. But then prayers by Sukadev, that's nice and important prayers. And then the process of, process of creation spoken by Brahma to Narada. And chapter 6 and 7, the Purusha Shukta, Lord Brahma's realization of the universal form and Leela incarnations. Then chapters 8 to 9, more questions by Parikshit. And in the ninth chapter, you've got the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam, where the Lord is speaking the four nutshell verses of the Bhagavatam to Lord Brahma. And then finally, you've got the explanation of the Chatur Sloki. And Sukadeva Goswami will also list the ten topics which are going to be discussed in the course of the 12 cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. So you can see the, the second cantos like that. It begins with Sukadeva Goswami speaking to Maharaj Parikshit, and then you've got Brahma speaking to Narada, and then you've got the Lord speaking to Brahma. <laughs> so you've got three different uh, discourse is going on here in the second canto. So that's what's happening in the second canto. So we're beginning from the first chapter. The first chapter. Let's see. Oh, well, the, we've got all the chapter here. You can see the first chapter. The first is t entitled the first step in God realization. The first step in God realization because it's, it's focusing more on the impersonal feature. We're going to hear about pantheism and how to see the universe as God. So this is like 
for the neophytes, for people who are not able to understand the Lord in a transcendental form, then they can contemplate the Lord in his impersonal aspect. So that's the first 14 verses, the first section is the best use of human life. And we'll hear about the importance of the human life. Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage Maharaj Parikshit. He wants to inspire him and enthuse him and to be really attentive and put his full concentration into hearing. And then the second half of the chapter, from verse 15 up to 39, is called Bhakti Mishra Yoga. It's yoga mixed with devotion, and the yoga is based on contemplating the universal form. Contemplating the universal form. You see also that the Astanga yoga process is begun uh, to control the mind, and then once the mind is controlled, then contemplating the universal form. Then the second chapter, where there's more attention given on the Paramatma, begins talking about detachment from the world of names, and then goes on to teach us about meditation on the Super Soul, and then how to achieve that supreme destination, and finishing with attraction for Krishna. Then the third chapter, the change in heart pure devotional service, describing the Bhagavan feature. So it begins with Krishna is the ultimate object of worship. And then you hear Sonaka Rishi take over. After Sukadeva Goswami told us that Krishna is the ultimate object of worship, then Sonaka Rishi starts to speak and he's eager for hearing Krishna Kata. Sonakarishi, remember, is in Naimisharanya, and he's the head of the sages. And he's actually speaking to Sutta Goswami, but Sutta Goswami is not speaking, it's Sonaka speaking. So that's the first three chapters. Uh, we're, oh, the, okay, then chapter four, you can see what's going on. More questions and Sukadeva Goswami's prayers, chapter four. Then chapter 5, Narada inquires and Brahma describes the Lord. Okay, so then what is the connection between all of this, between the two cantos? You were studying the first canto and you'll remember how the first canto ended. How the first canto ended with the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami. Maharaj Pariksit, of course, had been cursed. And he left home, he left everything, and he went to look for someone to guide him. And it happened that Shukadeva Goswami appeared. And he Maharaj, can we have a previous slide for a glimpse? I was noting it down, I could not able to know. This previous to this slide. Oh, you want to see the previous one? Yes. This one? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go over that in the future. You get, yeah. you get this. You don't need this information right now. Okay. So this is more what we're concerned with. We want to understand the connection between the two cantos. And remember, I was telling how Maharaj Parikshit wants someone to guide him. And you can see here. It's mentioned, O oh, trustworthy Brahmanas, I now ask you about my immediate duty. Please, after proper deliberation, tell me of the unalloyed duty of everyone in all circumstances, and specifically of those who are just about to die. So this is the situation that Maharaj Parikshit is just about to die. He's got seven days and he's anxious to make proper use of his time. So he wants to know what is the, what should he do 
to prepare himself for his departure from this world. And he's come to the assembly of the brahmanas on the banks of the holy river, and he wants to know. And then also another statement from the first canto. You are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. I am therefore begging you to show the way of perfection for all persons, and especially for one who is about to die. Please let me know what a man should hear, chant, remember, and worship, and also what he should not do. Please explain all this to me. So this is the uh, statement of Maharaj Pariksit. He wants to... Maharaj Pariksit wants to get guidance from the, the sages. And particularly, Sukadeva Goswami is going to come and he will be elected as the person who is the most qualified to guide him. All right, so this is the uh, no, uh, okay, wait. So this is the first canto. So the second canto then begins with uh, Sukadeva Goswami is appreciating the words of Maharaj Parikshit. So here you can see we've taken a statement from Srila Prabhupada's lecture from the first verse. If you look at the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, would someone like to read it for me, please? Question. Maharaj, from the screen? Yeah. Oh, no. Read from the, the book, the first canto, the second canto, first chapter, first verse. Kuta loka hitam rupa Atma be samataha pum sam Shota badi suja paraha. Yes, translation. Sisukate Goswami said, My dear king, your question is glorious because it is very beneficial to all kinds of people. The answer to this question is a prime subject matter for hearing and it is approved by all transcendentalists. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes. Okay, Madhiji, would you like to read here Prabhupada's quote? Yes, Prabhu. Nice, Maharaj. Lokhitam. Because this Bhagavad is so nice, transcendental subject matter, discussed about Krishna, it is Lokhitam. It should be spread all over the world. Loka does not mean your country or your society. Brahmana society, Goswami society. No. Lokhitam, for the benefit of the whole world, that is Lokhitam. Not only of this world, but other worlds also. Of the whole universe, Lokhitam, Nripa. My dear king, your Prashna, so this message of Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread all over the world. Srila Prabhupada lecture Srimad Bhagavatam 211, Vrindavan, 1974. Oh, thank you very much. Very nice. So, Lokahitam, this is for the benefit of the whole world. Not, and then Prabhupada said, not, not the world, not only the world, the whole universe. <laughs> and so, this Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread everywhere. So, this is the, the, the appreciation of Maharaj Parishit's question. Right? What was the question? Who remembers what was Maharaj Pariksha's question? Maharaj, uh, uh, 
परीक्षित महाराज आज दैट वॉट इज दी एन एलॉयड ड्यूटी ऑफ एवरी वन इन ऑल सर्कमस्टांसिस एस्पेशली वेन समन इज अबाउट टू डाई राइट थैंक यू वेरी मच यस so this is the subject matter of shrimad bhagavatam mm. one of the devotees here in mayapur he would joke about it he would say that uh, some people they they follow the thing called the art of living he said we follow the art of dying and he said this shrimad bhagavatam is all about dying how to prepare for death <laughs> so here you can see that this uh, point is being made actually it's a serious matter people in general they don't know they have no idea they never thought about it a, what what is a duty in death people all they only think about living when they get sick they don't think oh i'm going to die they're only thinking how to save themselves how to prolong their life they go running to the doctors and they're begging the doctors and shrila prab <coughs> shrila prab told himself how uh what someone he knew had gone to the doctors and the doctor told him oh you have this terrible disease you know you're going to die soon and the man begged the doctor oh doctor please give me four more years i need to finish my work and the doctor just laughed it's four more years he said i cannot do that said, i don't have that power so this is the typical situation in the material world that nobody wants to die but death is inevitable but death of course is simply the changing of the body people don't understand what is death and they don't understand also how to prepare for death they simply think how to prolong their life they want to live forever so they all have that kind of mentality that they think they can live forever okay so all right the topics of lord krishna are so auspicious that they purify the speaker the hearer and the inquirer they are compared to the ganges waters which flow from the toe of lord krishna wherever the ganges waters go they purify the land and the person who bathes in them similarly the topics of krishna are so pure that wherever they are spoken the place the hearer the inquirer the speaker and all concerned become purified from the purport of the first verse of the first chapter of the second canto shrimad bhagavatam so this is the power of speaking topics of krishna that it's beneficial for everyone the speaker benefits by speaking topics of krishna the speaker benefits and then the hearer who who inquired Well, and of course in this particular case it was sukadeva goswami is the speaker and maharaj parikshit is the hearer and the audience was also there the great sages who had all come to hear shrimad bhagavatam and so many sages had come so shrila prabhupad makes a point how these topics of lord krishna are compared to the ganges water and just as the ganges water purifies everything so the topics of krishna purify everything and prabhu pad had one sister uh, didi uh, what was her name didi didi diti huh dim ah uh, pishama pishama her name was pishama so pishama she used to always carry a little bottle of ganges water and she would always be sprinkling ganges water everywhere 
everywhere. After somebody had sat down and then they got up, she'd sprinkle Ganga water. Oh, she always had a bottle of Ganges water with her and she was always sprinkling it. So better than Ganges water is topics of Krishna because it can benefit everyone, the speaker, the hearer and the audience. Okay, so Sukadeva Goswami goes on to speak about the nature of materialistic life and he talks about householders and we learn that there are two kinds of householders. We have the Grihastas and the Grihamedis. So the Grihastas are those who live in family life So, we want to hear from you, what are some of these symptoms of the Grihamedis, which uh, distinguish them from the Grihastas? Hmm. Grihamedis, they do not do spiritual advancement, they do not give charity, they do not do austerity, and they do not follow the Sastras. Well, you know, I don't know if you're quite correct about that. You say they do not give charity. You know, there are Grihamedis who give charity, but they will give charity for material purposes. You see, it's not spiritual. It's not, you see, as you know, in Bhagavad charity can be in the mode of passion and the mode of ignorance. And so Grihamedis, they can give charity. So I would be cautious about them, you know, if you say they don't give charity, I think, you know, Grihamedis, they, they could give charity, but they could also be Grihamedis, that they're giving charity for their own material benefit, not for the, the pleasure of Krishna, not, as a, not for their purification. Do you agree? Yes, Maharaji, yes, I do agree. Okay, so what what were some of the other points which you said about Grihas Grihamedis, the symptoms? They do not follow the the principles or the Vedic literature, Vedic follow um, Vedic scriptures. They do mm -hmm. not have time. They have only time for earning money, so they mm -hmm. have very less time for spiritual uh, development. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're very much concerned for money, right? They will they'll, they'll make great efforts to get money, that's definitely there. They want money for their own sense gratification. They're eager to get money for their own sense gratification. You know, they may do Vedic... You know, their purpose is not for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. They want some material benefit. And so there's also Grihamedi mentality. They're pious, but it's still, <laughs> they're still Grihamedi, right? Medi meaning envious. The Griha is the home and Medi is the envy. They have this envy towards others. They see that others have got some something better than them, that they're more opulently situated, they're enjoying more their material life, and they feel envious of them. So that's it, the Grihamedi, that they tend to be envious of others, and they'll always try to compete and want to do better than others. And yeah? Someone else who'd like to contribute here about the symptoms of Grihamedis? They like to hear about many subject topics um, other than spirituality. Yes, yes, they're, they're, they like to watch Bollywood movies, 
they'll, they'll watch movies for hours, and, or they'll watch the cricket match for hours. But if there's a Bhagavad Kata, they can hardly sit for 10 minutes. All right? And so that's, that's one of the features of Grihamedis. They can spend so much money when they go to the mall, but you ask them to give donation for the temple, oh, I have no money. That's a Grihamedi. Maharaj, they are blind to spiritual knowledge. That they are yeah. materially engrossed and they want only a sense gratification. Uh -huh. Yes, they're blind to spiritual knowledge and they're eager for their own sense gratification. They're very much attached to their family, their fam own family members. Everything is centered around the family. The center of their enjoyment is all their own little family and their materialistic life. So these are common symptoms of the Grihamedis. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing how this Grihamedi have many subject matters for hearing and chanting, but they are not inclined to hear about Krishna. But they have many other things to talk about. They're very busy in gossiping. And we see everywhere people have their talking and mobile phones and talking back and forth. So they're very anxious for all of this. So in this way, Sukadeva Goswami is describing the Grihamedi. Uh, so Sukadeva Goswami is replying to Maharaj Pariksha's question. He, he wants to explain, first of all, what we should not do. Before he explains what we should do, he first of all said well, what we shouldn't do. And he says we shouldn't waste our precious human life. We shouldn't waste our valuable human life. One second loss can never be brought back. All right? So that's one thing. And how do we waste our valuable human life? Well, one way is by hearing all these mundane topics, by hearing the news, the gossip, the politics, what's going on everywhere, what's going on in the next house and the next street, what's going on in the next city, and hearing everything from everywhere else. We like to hear all the mundane news, what's the gossip. So this is Gramya Kata. And this is very detrimental, very harmful to our Krishna consciousness. We hear all the nonsense, our heart will become polluted. And then the other symptom of the Grihamedis, anxious, very anxious to get money, They're running after money the whole day. What to speak the whole day, they'll run the whole night as well. In some places, people have not one job, not two jobs, but three jobs. They have a job in the day, a job in the night, and then a job on the weekend. And then you get ladies, you know, that maybe they're a maid. The one lady, she's a maid, she goes to one house and she does all the work. Then she goes to another house and, she, and she's got like four or five houses. Every day she'll go and do the work there. This way she's making, get, collecting income from four or five different houses in one day, every day. So very eager to make money. They're anxious to get money. And what's it money for? It's all just for their sense gratification, for the education, for the car, for the new home. Oh, so many things we think we need. And then also, we shouldn't waste our time just simply sleeping, or then sexual indulgence. So sleeping, people like to sleep a lot. Then we should be regulated, be careful. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna said, don't eat too much or eat too little, and don't sleep too much or sleep too little. 
So sleep sufficient, don't sleep more, don't sleep less. Be careful, be regulated. And then taking, taking shelter of the fallible soldiers. Who are the fallible soldiers? Can someone tell me? Wife, children, relatives. Yes, Prabhu. Wife, children, relatives, money, power. Body. Why are they called fallible? Because they're temporary. You cannot rely on them. They will not take us back to Godhead. All right. They won't take us back to Godhead. They cannot save us at the time of death. Of course, if they're devotees, they can help us to remember Krishna at the time of death. But materialistic families, generally, they, they don't do that. So they're, they're just fallible soldiers. And, and often they're waiting for people to die so that they can get the money that all good is gone, now we can enjoy his money. <laughs> that mentality is there. And when somebody goes from the family, then all the family members will fight over the property, who should get what and how much they should get. This way, constant fighting and arguing. So people with the material world, we tend to take shelter of the family members and just like your king lives in a castle and he has his army there his guards there to protect him and so in the same way every the man materialistic man lives at home and he's surrounded by his family members and the family members are all there to and he thinks they will protect me from death no one will can come my family are all here and just like dogs when somebody comes to the door, then the dog will bark. The dog is saying, why are you coming here? I'm already here. So the soldiers are there to protect the elderly people. <laughs> but of course, the soldiers are hopeless. They cannot conquer over death. Cruel death comes and takes everyone from this world. So here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. Is talking about the materialistic people, he said, they are blind. They are thinking that these things will give him protection. Pramata. Pramata means crazy. Crazy. By craziness, he is thinking these things will give me protection from Srimad Bhagavatam lecture on the fifth verse of the first chapter of the second canto. So what things will give me protection? What, are, what is being talked about here when they say these things will give me protection? Harinam Maharaj? No, no. These things will give body. me... Body, wife and children. Yes, the wife, the children, the servants, the dogs, the money, the home. They, are they going to protect you? No, no, no. They're not going to protect you. They're not going to save you. But people are so pramata, they're so crazy. They're thinking they will protect us. So here you can see the soldiers, <laughs> fallible soldiers, poor guys. In the desert there, you can see tough life and be there in the desert like that. So Prabhupada says, someone like to read for us? Who's not read? I can read Maharaj. Go ahead then. Uh, mission. They'll devote the whole day for reading this newspaper or some fiction or some novels for this and that. But they have no time to hear Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Apashitam Atma Tattvam. Because they have no interest in self-realization. People have lost all interest. This is the position. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential at the present moment. 
How important is the Krishna Consciousness Movement, Prabhupada's mission, to give people some knowledge? We distribute books, we try to awaken people. All right, so here we've, we've broken down the first section of this chapter, these first 14 verses where Sukadeva Goswami is preaching to Maharaj Parikshit. So he said in the first four verses, and two, three, four, he was saying what we shouldn't do. So then five and six, he starts to describe what everyone should do. What everyone should do, right? What should they do? Takes five and six. Someone can read the verse, five and six, just read the translation. Tasmad Bharata Sarvatma Bhagavan Ishvara Harihi O oh, descendant of King Bharata, one who desires to be free from all miseries must hear about, glorify, and also remember the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul, the controller, and the savior from all miseries. Okay. So that's what we should do. We should hear about, glorify, and remember the personality of Godhead. And then, text 7 to 10, then he speaks about, Sukadeva Goswami speaks about hearing and chanting is, is the activity of liberated souls. He talks about, yeah, uh, could you read text 7, Prabhu? Text seven, six. No, seven. Text seven. Prayena munayo rajan nebruta bidise dhata nairgunyasta ramante sma guna anu kathane hare. O King Parikit, mainly the topmost transcendentalists who are above the regulative principles and restrictions, take pleasure in describing the glories of the Lord. All right. And so even the, the liberated souls, the advanced transcendentalists, they take pleasure in hearing and chanting. And then you can see text number eight and nine, Sukadev Goswami just gives himself as an example the Sukadeva Goswami is a liberated soul from his very birth. He's liberated. He, after taking birth, he'd been in the womb, first of all, for uh, 16 years. And then when he came out, he immediately left home. So he's a liberated soul from birth. But he was attracted to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. And that is shown to us, that was stated by the Atmarama Sloka. Right? You studied the Atmarama verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. That those people, even those who are Atmarama, who are taking pleasure in the self, they are attracted to hear the glories of the Lord. And Sukadeva Goswami himself was attracted to that. And then text 10, qualifications for and benefits from hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. Qualifications, not everyone is going to be able to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. Some people are just not ready for it, they're not qualified. And then he will also describe what is the benefit of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. The, the Srimad Bhagavatam is very purifying. 
So like that. Then text 11, the way of success. And 12 to 14, the good fortune of Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit is certainly fortunate. And we will hear, we may think, oh, he's unfortunate, he's cursed to die. But actually, he's very fortunate. And Sukadeva Goswami is going to convince him of his good fortune. How, how fortunate he is, that although he's cursed to die, he is so fortunate, he's got seven days to focus entirely on hearing topics of Krishna. In the association of Sukadeva Goswami, and many other great sages. So he is really fortunate. Okay, so we ask you what kind of what what qualifications do you think are required to properly hear Srimad Bhagavatam? You know, people come sometimes, you know, you you maybe you've had experience yourself, maybe you have to give class. And you give class to the audience, and you look at the audience, and you see somebody sitting, they got their mobile phone in their hand, and they're playing with their mobile phone, and they're working their mobile phone, and, and you're talking, but you can tell, they're not, although they're in the class, they're not really, their attention is not really on the class. Although physically they may be there, but they're not actually hearing. So another kind of hearer, somebody's there, you know, and, and they're sitting and their eyes are closed and they're not moving. <laughs> so it happened, it happened one time, at least one time, uh, Prabhupada was giving class and, you know, a devotee was sitting there and, uh, and Prabhupada noticed him and Prabhupada said to him, you're sleeping. And Prabhupada, he, the, the devotee immediately sat up and said, Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. And Prabhupada said, you are sleeping. He said, no Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I wasn't sleeping. So Prabhupada said to him, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, then you are asleep. <laughs> so this was Prabhupada's argument that he didn't appreciate devotees to sit with their eyes closed and not moving. He liked to see that they were alert and hearing. So qualifications of an ideal hearer, they should give proper attention to hearing. What do you think, some of you, some kind of reaction to that? what kind of quali what, what do you feel is the good qualification for an ideal hearer? Um, Maharaj, what I feel is that um, they should be sincere and eager to hear the message of, you know, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. If they are there present, it's just not, you know, they should be mentally and physically present. So they should be sincere and eager. Yes, that's a good qualification. I think that was mentioned also in the first chapter of the first canto, right? Yes, Maharaj. That eagerness to hear, yeah, that's a very good, qual a very important quality of a hearer, that they're very eager to hear. Nobody forced them, <laughs> right? They came on their own. Good. Yeah, the eagerness. Anything else, Prabhus? Maharaj, you should not ask challenging questions, like to test the speaker that does he have good knowledge. You should have full faith while hearing. Mm, okay, yes, we shouldn't, Prabhupada talks about that in the Bhagavad Gita, 4th chapter 34, because in chapter 4, 34, Lord Krishna is describing, try to learn the truth by approaching the spiritual master and inquire from him, right? Tadvidi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya, and that we're encouraged to put questions to the speaker. But this, the questions, Prabhupada said, the questions should not be of a challenging nature and they shouldn't be ridiculous either. And so, of course, Prabhupada sometimes would have to deal with these kind of things. Mm, yeah. 
challenging questions. People want to know what, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, <laughs> these kind of stupid questions. And then the other challenging question, can God make a stone so heavy that even he can't lift it? And so this kind of things, this kind of stupid and challenging questions. So here I shouldn't, you know, should, shouldn't put these kind of questions. Yes, okay. Anything else? Uh, yes, Krishna, Krishna. Yeah. Please. Okay, Prabhu. I should have faith in Guru and Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, one more thing I remember I heard in one of our senior duties lecture is like uh, somebody should hear to transform the heart. They should it should be like uh, the pearl, you know, like the it goes, the drop goes and then becomes a pearl. It should not be that the drop falls on some hot metal and it evaporates. So the knowledge that we are hearing, we should retain it in our heart and you know utilize that and apply that knowledge uh, to transform our being uh, rather than just hear and forget. Yes, right. Yeah, we say go in one ear and out the other, right? <laughs> in one ear, out the other. Nothing is retained. It should go to the heart, right? Okay, good. We should retain. Sometimes you ask people, what was the class about? And they say, oh, uh, then I forget. <laughs> they didn't remember anything from the class. Nothing remember, nothing went in. So, yeah, we should try to absorb something from the classes. Hearing, should hear with careful attention. Yes, anything else? Yes, Mara, so the person... Person should not be envious and a professional preacher by learning uh, the, this knowledge, he should not use it for preaching and making money out of it. Okay, yes. We shouldn't have the business mentality in presenting. Sometimes, you know, some, some speakers, they will put on a performance. You get some people, they can, they can, they're very good at crying in front of the audience. Then they put on a dramatic performance. And so that's the speaker. Now what about the hearer? You know, we're talking about qualifications of a hearer. They should have a service attitude and they should be respectfully hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, very good. Yes, service attitude, the attitude there. Service attitude and submissively hearing. He, he yes, people. He should be receptive, open to understand the new or the open to understand. He, he should be receptive when he's hearing. All right, receptivity, right. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Yes, Manaji? They shouldn't be hearing in a challenging mood. Yes, right. We mentioned that. They shouldn't be challenging. Okay, so then we'll go on and we want to hear about this uh, statement which was made by Sukadeva Goswami. He was describing about chanting the holy name Harinam Anukirtanam. Hari Nam Anukirtanam, meaning constant chanting of the holy name. As Srila Sridhar Swami, the, one, the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam, he said that there's no other method of self-realization which, which can be more beneficial than this. This meaning Hari Nam Anukirtanam, constant chanting of the holy name. That's very beneficial. And Srila Jiva Goswami, he said, he's added a condition, one must avoid Nama Parad in order to achieve the ultimate result of chanting. Right? So this is a condition to the chanting. You may chant 
uh, we say one may chant the holy name for many births, but if we, we don't avoid offenses, then we won't get the goal of the chanting. We won't get love of God. But you can go on chanting for many births, but you'll never get the, if, we, if we're still chanting with offenses. So we have to be very cautious to avoid offenses. And here's a quote from Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He says that among the angas of bhakti, hearing, chanting and remembering are the three chief ones. This has been stated in verse 5. Among those three, chanting is the chief. So there are nine angas of bhakti. We know there are nine angas of bhakti. So Sukadeva Goswami wanted to clarify how exactly, what is the most powerful, most potent form of bhakti to engage in. So he particularly mentioned hearing, chanting, and remembering. And now Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur is saying that among the three, the most, the best, the most important is chanting. Because where chanting is performed properly, there will be also hearing and remembering. It will be included within the chanting. If we do the chanting properly, without offence, with full attention, then we will also hear and we will also remember. It's all included within chanting. So in this way, the chanting is the most important, the chief of all the nine processes of devotion. And such chanting should be anukirtan, constant following in the footsteps of previous authorities and according to the level of one's realizations. So constant chanting. Of course, that's also mentioned in Shikshastikam by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He says, Kirtaniya Sadahari. Always chant the holy name. So here also in Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami, long before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, Sukadeva Goswami had also said, Hari Manu Kirtanam, constant chanting of the holy name is recommended. And Jiva Goswami is telling us, watch out for the offenses. All right, someone like to read the verse for us? Text number 11 on the slide. Chetan nirvidya manana michyatama kutubhayam yoginam nirpanirnitam hare nama nukirtanam O King, constant chanting of the holy name of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is a doubtless and fearless way of success for all, including those who are free from all material desires, those who are desirous of the material enjoyment, and also those who are of self satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge. Yes, good. Okay. So, an exercise for you. Discuss with a partner how to proactively counteract offenses to the holy name. Right? We know there are 10 offenses in chanting the holy name. We recite them, maybe you recite them every morning in the temples, we often do that. If you stay in the temple every morning after Mangal Arti, we recite the ten offenses. So how to avoid committing these offenses to the holy name? What is some, have you got some strategy? We ask you, write down the main ideas for sharing them with the rest of the class. All right, so can we give you a, what, five minutes to just do something on this? How, about the, how many people are here? Is it 12? 25, Maharaj. No? Huh? 25, Maharaj. Oh, everybody came in? Yes, Maharaj. Not so many, huh? Okay. So can uh, we'll have groups of two and one group of three? Uh, sure, Maharaj. I'll just create out 
the breakout rooms just in a minute. Just for five minutes. Uh, Maharaj, should we divide each of the offense between the teams or every team can choose any offense? Any offense you can choose, yes. You know, I want you to take your break at this time also. Then we'll give you 10 minutes so that in the course of this 10 minutes you can take a break. You can have your break. So five minutes break and five minutes for this exercise. So we'll come back in 10 minutes, give you some time to think about this defense against Nam Aparad. Yes, any offense. So all the breakout rooms are now open. Um, okay, very good. Devotees can start joining. Hare Krishna, we are 10 of us, is it here? Yes, Praji, you already have got the invite. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please, please join the breakout rooms. Sorry, Mataji, it says here the host has opened breakout rooms. Please wait to be assigned. Ah, okay, got it. Thanks. Yes, I'll just be back for you. You please join.
it it seems like uh, the time for the breakout room got over so we are back to the main session now the five minutes is done <laughs> Uh, Maraj, you are muted. Please uh, uh, unmute yourself, Maraj. Okay, yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Five minutes break. Um, we can start with room one. Um, it was it had Iskon Paniyati and Premanand Gopinath Prabhu. <laughs> Mataji, you could not uh, speak to each other. <laughs> um, it seems, uh, yeah. Oh, it shows that Prabhuji didn't join. Like you joined, but Prabhuji didn't. Oh, only one person. <laughs> could not. Group two can go on. Group two was Ashwini Shinde Mataji, Chaitanya Hari Prabhu, and Nalima Mataji. Well, only two of us there. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, we discuss how we, we have to. Uh, keep our mind focused, especially uh, fix the time for chanting so that it, uh, for, so that we can, we will be able to appreciate the fixed time. And also second thing is, uh, Mataji was also highlighting, even when we deal with the uh, devotees or even outsiders, especially when preaching, we have to be gentle, not to offense anybody so that that incident might not interfere in our chanting. So this is the main two, two things that we discuss. Uh, Mataji, you can add in anything? Uh, yes, Prabhuji, I want to add one more point that uh, we should keep uh, ourselves away from the gadgets such as mobile so that we can uh, be focusing on our chanting and our chanting will not be inattentive chanting. That is also one of the offenses, no? Out of 10 offenses. So, yeah, that's what, uh, that's what I wanted to add in that. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important point. You have to be very careful about these mobile devices. They're very distracting. And it's a good idea to put them far away or even turn them off when you do your japa. Just get in the habit to just do your japa far away from your telephone and leave it aside. And first do your japa. The first and the most important thing is the japa. Either turn off your mobile telephone or keep it away, keep it far away out of reach. But don't keep it with you. Don't be... You know, sometimes people have the bead bag in one hand and the mobile phone in the other hand. <laughs> and the attention is more on the mobile than on the japa. It's, it's not good. Someone else? So, uh, Maharaj Group 3 had you and D.T. Surya Kumar Prabhu. Myself, Maharaj. All right. So, uh, Surya Kumar Prabhu. Surya Kumar Prabhu. Sorry, I was unmuted. Okay. Um, I was actually uh, uh, having this problem of uh, uh, the mind is actually not, uh, it, it runs while I chant. And um, I find it difficult to actually bring it back. But uh, there's a difference when I actually do the chanting uh, early in the morning, uh, especially uh, uh, during that stipulated time, uh, one and a half hours before sunrise, uh, or to be specific, after Mangla Arti. And uh, that chanting is actually quite effective uh, as compared to uh, the evening chanting, especially on Japa, and uh, the mind gets distracted. So, uh, emphasize on the morning chanting the yes. mandar, after Mandar. Yes, very good. Yes, it's good advice. Take advantage of the auspicious time, the Brahma Muhurta in the early morning before the sunrise. It's a very auspicious period to do our japa meditation. And all different spiritual faiths and meditation groups, they often have that program, the early morning prayers. 
so temples they have Mangal Arti. So before Mangal Arti, take advantage, try to chant some rounds before the Mangal Arti and after Mangal Arti also. That's more powerful. Later on in the day, so many more thoughts are there to distract the mind. So try to make that our business of the early morning hours. And we also said loud chanting helps. Yes, Maharaj. Whenever we have difficulty in hearing each and every syllable of Hare Krishna Mahantra, so Maharaj kindly recommended that in such case, loud chanting helps. So it trains the mind that way. Haridas Thakur and Kolaveka Sridhar and these people, they all ch they chanted loudly. <laughs> they didn't chant softly. They didn't chant in the mind. Loud, loud chanting. And that way, more people get the benefit. Everyone who hears their benefit. <laughs> of course, you have to consider time and place and circumstance. Your family may not appreciate. <laughs> All right, anything else? Uh, Maharaj, uh, room four had Diksha Mataji and Namkirti Mataji, and room six had Daya Lakshmi Mataji and Sachinandan Hale Praji. So after room four, um, room six can present. Yes. Anything else to add from these groups? Yes, Maharaj. Like Krishna Maharaj, I, uh, I and Namkirti Mataji try to take one one offense of the holy name and we try to write a positive from that. So like the first one is to bless them, the devotees. So we thought that we'll be glorifying the devotees, write some gratitude to them. And uh, by this, we can try to come and try to associate with like-minded devotees while chanting. Second, uh, to consider the names of demigods like Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma to be equal. For that, we thought we'll be respectful to the demigods and uh, we will pray for pure devotional service to them. And third, disobeying the orders of the spiritual master, we will try to associate more with the disciples so that we remember the goal of our initiation and try to follow. The fourth one, to bless me in the Vedic literature, we thought that we'll be reading the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam, that how important it is, and then we can and try to read more Srimad Bhagavatam. The, regarding the fifth one, to consider the glories of chanting Hare Krishna to be imagination. For that, one can hear from the bona fide spiritual master or one, that devotee who has realizations of holy name, that who is oneself uh, uh, trying to practice sincerely and who has realizations. So okay. Can... okay, thank you very much. This is also, this is nice you're thinking how to do do good not to do offense how to do how to avoid the offenses and you're correct instead of criticizing the devotees appreciate the devotees very good very nice okay we have to go ahead let's uh, see uh, yeah we'll, we'll just go ahead i think there's we don't want to take any more time on this uh, let me see here. Inattention, the main offense. Harida spoke to Lord Chaitanya. Inattention is counted as one of the apparats. Even if one successfully overcomes all the other offenses in chanting, and one is chanting continuously, love of God may not come. One should know that the reason for this is that one is committing the offense known as pramada or inattention. This offense will block progress to prem. So inattention, the main offense, it's the seed of the other, all other offenses. All other offenses come from this one thing, from this inattention. This is the seed of offence, and so we must be very careful to guard against this. Uh, how to avo avoid inattention? By giving full attention, by focusing the mind to hear. Srila Prabhupada said… Uh, this slide is not said. Huh? 
Maharaj, this slide is not shared if you are sharing uh, the slide. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. let me see what happened. I'll have to go back. Oh. Hmm. Let me see where are we? Okay, share the slide. Yes, Maharaj, you can see now. Okay. All right, so this was a quote. This is inattention. All right. We're talking about inattention. This offence, I said, this is the seed of offence. So we have to be very careful with how, how to avoid inattention. We have to give attention and louder chanting. Loud chanting will allow us to give more attention. Srila Prabhupada explains, it's not a question of the mind. You use the ear to hear and the tongue to chant. So don't become absorbed in the mind. This inattention is due to the mind. We're focusing on the mind, our concentration, we're listening to the mind. Instead of hearing the mantra, instead of hearing the holy name, we're just hearing our mind. So this is inattention. We have to be careful to avoid this. All right. The antidote to an uncontrolled mind. Srila Prabhupada says, but there is a quality to such utterances also. It depends on the quality of feeling. From the prayers of Queen Kunti purport. And so chanting, there's quality in chanting. We know there's nam aparad, there's nam abhas, shudanam. So there's quality. So the quality depends on the quality of feeling. How much we're feeling for the holy name, we're calling to Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada would say we should call in the mood of a child separated from the mother. That kind of mood. So this kind of feeling. We want to feel close to Krishna. And here we mention about making the effort. We have to try, we have to try for these things. It, it doesn't happen just mechanically, it doesn't happen just on its own. We have to really want to make the effort. So effort is a gateway to bring us from Nama Parad to Nama Bas, when we start to make the effort. And here we put a couple of quotes in also. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said, unless we extend our best efforts earnestly and qualify ourselves for the Lord's mercy, it is never, it is next to impossible that we can be rescued from our fallen condition. And from the Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter seven, text number six, the revival of the dormant affection of love of God does not depend on the mechanical system of hearing and chanting, but it solely and wholly depends on the causeless mercy of the Lord. When the Lord is fully satisfied with the sincere efforts of the devotee, he may endow him with his loving transcendental service. So that, again, the effort, the sincere efforts of the devotee, when Krishna is satisfied that we really made a great effort to chant the holy name, then Krishna will give his mercy. <laughs> so we point out to you that 
it's not only the mind, but the physiology also affects the psychology. And the mind is affected. Just like we mentioned, moving our eyes around the room, certainly our mind will be affected. You move the, and we see things in the room, we move the eyes around the room, the mind will be drawn, contemplate the different things in the room. Our chant, while closing our eyes or staring at one object, or sitting calmly, not shaking your body. So different ways, different things, different people do. Some people move, some people shake their body, some people sit very straight, and some people walk around the room. And so many things, different ways people do. So it affects also our thinking, the way we move, the things we do, is going to affect our thinking. So we are, ask, we are asking you, how can we create a favorable lifestyle for chanting the holy name? Chanting the holy name is our most important business. It's the most important instruction from the spiritual master. So we, are, we want to hear from you, what would make a favorable lifestyle which we can do to help us to chant the holy name? Now, some of, you have already, some of you have already mentioned of waking up early and getting a good start to the day. If you wake up early in the morning, you can get up early and maybe in time for the Brahma Mahurta, and you can do some chanting at that time. Then it's very good. Yes, so that's one thing you can do to make chanting successful. Anything else? Marajib is going to say something. Uh, the way yes. we spend, the way we spend our twenty two hours, that will also uh, reflect be reflected in our next two hours of japa. So we should be very conscious in our dealings with devotees and even with anybody, because that will uh, be reflect uh, getting reflections there. And also we can be read the uh, songs of the acharya so that we can be more prayerful. Anything we can do, anything we do over the day, we, we can be prayerful so that it helps in our japa the next day. Okay, yes. So arranging our life so that we can be Krishna conscious and it should be in, in the service of Krishna 22 hours, two hours for japa and 22 hours in Krishna's service. Uh, um, we, we want to, of course, we want to avoid the modes of passion and ignorance and try to associate more in the mode of goodness. Hmm? Anything else? Uh, if we can be in association with the devotees. Yes, I think that's also a good point, an important Okay. Now somebody has to put your microphone off. You have to mute, mute yourself. There's a lot of talk there in the background. Please mute yourself. So association is very helpful to chant the holy name. Certainly, if you if you can get. Atmosphere like in front of the DT or Tulsi Maharani or Sacred River is favorable atmosphere also conducive. Okay, so if you have a temple room, you have deities at home, go in front of the deities and chant. And if you have Tosi, also bring Tosi in and sit with Tosi and chant the holy name. Actually, Prabhupada, one time I was in New York, Prabhupada had his picture taken with Tosi. He said, this is all we need, Tosi and the holy name. So you chant the holy name and you worship Tosi. And that way life is successful. Anything else? Uh, sitting in one place so that nobody come to disturb or keep mobile and other thing away from. 
Okay, okay, we mentioned here are asking what good habits could we incorporate in our lives in order to improve our japa. So you're bringing up some good point which we already talked about the the, 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 the mobile phone. That it's a good idea like switch it off or put it away or something. Don't take calls during your japa period. Right? Turn off your mobile phone. Uh, put it out of sight, get it away from you, leave it at home or something, leave it in your car somewhere, get rid of it. It's a good uh, habit. habit. Regulated food style and sleeping on time. What's that now? Regulated food, eating of the food at right time and then sleeping on time, light dinner. Okay, yes, good habits. They want to wake up early in the morning, better you don't eat heavy food at night. When I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, I was told Srila Prabhupada had instructed no devotee should eat grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. No grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. And actually many temples, they won't serve prasadam in the evening. They only serve prasadam in the morning and lunchtime. In the evening, no prasadam. Just some hot milk is there. Maybe some guest comes, a life member or something, we can give him some maha prasadam. But we don't usually have the habit of serving heavy meals to devotees in the evening because it makes it very difficult for them to wake up in the morning. So it's a good habit. Eat less at night and eat more, eat your main meal in the daytime, don't eat at night or eat less. Pranayama, pranayama and exercise also help. Exercise. Well, you can get a lot of pranayama and exercise doing kirtan, dance in the kirtan. If you go to kirtan, chant and dance, that's a good pranayama, that's a good exercise. Chanting. To maintain a, I'm sorry, to maintain a sadhana chart and have, have it reported to someone. <laughs> yeah, you can try. <laughs> you have to be honest <laughs> to do that. Okay. What do you do outside of your 16 rounds that nourishes your japa? And so someone brought up this point, you know, that our day should be Krishna conscious, 22 hours should be in the service of Krishna. So what could we do outside of the 16 rounds that nourishes your japa? Yes, what, what do you suggest? What nourishes our japa? Hearing, uh, hearing uh, lectures. Yes. Uh, from senior devotees and yes. uh, help get the help take advices from them also yes, engaging in other various sevas that keep us motivated throughout the day yes especially we need to hear the scriptures we need to hear the philosophy that will nourish our japa if we hear the, the philosophy about the holy name it will help us to chant better and what do you consider to what do you do outside of the 16 rounds that hinders the japa? In other words, what are the bad things for our japa? Blaspheme others, doing fault finding of devotees. Okay. Laziness. Yes, what? Getting angry to the family members. Getting angry, arguing, passion. Associating with materialistic people. Associating with non-devotees, yes. Okay, so these are things which don't help our japa. Mm -hmm. All right, going ahead. There's text number 11. Someone like to read? Nirnitam, decided truth. According to Sri Shukadev Goswami, this way of attaining success is an established fact, concluded not only by him, but also by all other previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need of further evidence. Srimad Bhagavatam 21.11 Purpose. 
All right. So what is the way of success? Constant chanting of the holy name. Yes, right. Anukirtanam. Harinam Anukirtanam. Constant chanting of the holy name. And so this is accepted by the Acharyas. There's no need of further evidence. It's stated here, Srimad Bhagavatam. So someone brought up the point that blasphemy can be very bad, it can harm our chanting. We criticize devotees, nonstant talking, talking a lot of prajalpa. Mm. So here's a statement. Could someone please read this for us? Dealing with blasphemy. Quoting from Markande Puran, Sri Goswami Ji says that one should neither blaspheme the devotee of the Lord nor indulge in hearing others who are engaged in belittling a devotee of the Lord. A devotee should try to restrict the will of fear by cutting out his tongue and being unable to commit, uh, being unable to do so, one should commit suicide rather than hear the blaspheming of the devotee of the Lord. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.1.12. <laughs> All right, so that we don't want to hear, we don't want to hear the blasphemy of the devotees and we don't want to, we don't want to blaspheme them and we don't want to hear others blaspheme devotees. We don't want to hear blasphemy and we don't want to speak any blasphemy either. It's not good for us. And here you can see that the Shastras actually say, that to stop people from committing that kind of blasphemy, we should be willing to cut out their tongue. But of course, we're, we're not encouraged to do that in this day, but said that the, you, you, can, you, you should commit suicide rather than hear the blasphemy of the devotee. Of course, we don't want to do, commit suicide either, because devotees are like brahmanas, and so kill a brahmana is not good, right? And we don't want to be the, have the sin of killing a brahmana, that's very bad for us. So what we should do, we leave that place, or get away from that place, don't want to be near it. And that's important for us. There was one devotee, his name was Vamsidas Babaji. He was a great devotee in the time of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. So this Vamsi Das Babaji, he would never hear any blasphemy or any criticism or others. If people would come to him and if they, if they would say to him, what do you think of the government? He would simply say, oh Govardhan? He would change it from the government. He wouldn't hear government. He would just hear Govardhan. So like that, that's one way of uh, avoiding hearing blasphemy. We just, you know, people were talking something negative. We can make it Krishna conscious if you're very expert. Otherwise, easiest thing is just get away, run away. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to go, I have no time. Don't stay to here. And don't encourage them with their prajalpa. Just keep away from them. All right, and then Sukadeva Goswami then goes on. He gives an example about Gadvanga Maharaj. That's a nice example, an important example, Gadvanga Maharaj. And his example is very relevant in the case of Maharaj Parikshit, right? Why is this important for Maharaj Parikshit? First of all, you all know who Gadvanga Maharaj is, right? Gadvanga, Gadvanga Maharaj, what, what happened to him? He had only a few moments left. So Why? He did not. What had he been doing? What had Gadvanga Maharaj been doing? He had been fighting for long and then he was he wanted to rest for something. Who and was he fighting him. for? Who was he fighting for? Who was he fighting against? Demigod. For demigods. 
He was fighting for demigods against the Asuras. Right, he was fighting for the demigods, right? And uh, the demigods were, were pleased with him. He did well. He fought well on their behalf against the demons. But then Kartikeya came. So when Kartikeya came, then they told Katvanga Maharaj, okay, now you can have a rest, we don't need you anymore. Kartikeya is here and he'll be the general. So Katvanga Maharaj was relieved and they said, yeah, we want to reward you. And so he, he, they said, we'll give you a benediction, some benediction. But Katvanga Maharaj said, just tell me, how long have I got remaining? And then they, the demigods told them, you have only a moment. You have only a moment of time. So it said that Katvanga Maharaj, he had gone there to the heavenly planets to fight for the demigods against the demons. So when he got that news that he only had a moment, he immediately came down to the earth. And he came down to the earthly abode and he immediately sat and fixed his mind on the, on the Lord and gave up his body. And this way he left the world and went to the supreme abode. So he came down to this abode because he under, if he was on the heavenly planet, so there, there's too much attraction, too much opulence on the heavenly planets. He thought, it would be better for me to go back to the earthly abode. And from the earthly abode, he can easily concentrate on the Lord and go back to God. So this example was very relevant because Maharaj Parikshit is there, and Maharaj Parikshit, he has seven days. So Maharaj Parikshit may be thinking that, oh, you know, I don't have, I don't have much time. Do I have enough time? Am I going to be? Is it is it time enough for me to to uh, to become perfect in this? because I have to hear and I have to chant, I have to remember, is seven days going to be enough for me? So Sukadeva Goswami tells Maharaj Parikshit about Karvanga Maharaj, that you don't have to worry, you've got a lot of time, you've got seven days. Karvanga Maharaj only had a moment, but he could get success. He just took advantage of that one moment. So it's, it's not the long life which is important. And so you can see at the, the bottom of the page here, we see better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. A long life. We see uh, examples of trees which have a long life. Trees have a very long, some trees live for hundreds and some trees live thousands of years. But what is their consciousness? Most trees generally, they have very low, very stunted consciousness. They have to, to be in the body of a tree. It's very limited consciousness. So Srila Prabhupada says, better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. So people think, oh, it's very great, live a long life, if you can live to be 100 years, oh, very wonderful. But 100 years is nothing. In Kali Yuga, people don't live very long live a hundred years. In the pre previous age, Dwapara Yuga, people lived 1,000 years. In Treta Yuga, they were living 10,000 years. And in Satya Yuga, they had a life of 100,000 years. So just think, what is our life in the Kali Yuga? is very short, temporary, 70 years, your life is finished. Any, anything over 70 years, then it's a bonus. Time is up. And so it's not the duration of life which is important, but it's the consciousness which is important.
So Prabhupada explaining this important point here in relation to Katvanga Maharaj, because we may think, well, Katvanga Maharaj, you know, oh, he shouldn't have died, he should have lived longer. If he'd lived longer, he could have done more. But it's not so much how long you live, but what's important is the consciousness which we have. We do want to have the proper consciousness. So even a moment of full consciousness is good for us. All right, so here's another exercise here for you today. We ask you to evaluate that above statement with other scriptural evidence. All right, which statement? Better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. Do you, we want to hear from you. Does this support the scriptures? Are there any evidence in the scriptures which is contrary to this? We want, you can see the purpose of this exercise, it, to help students develop analytical, interpretive and evaluative skills, particularly in respect of the practical application of Shastric knowledge. Consider apparently conflicting references and to still draw a conclusion consistent, consistent with both. So this, these kind of things are going on constantly. Maybe you're a member of different groups or forums and they're discussing different controversial issues. For example, there's controversial issues about things like female Diksha gurus. You know, it's a controversial issue. Some people are very much opposed and other people are in favor. Oh, so we have to discuss these things on the basis of scripture. So here's another quote. Today we're not considering female Diksha gurus. Today we're just talking about, is a moment of full consciousness really better than a long life of illusion? Hare and, Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. yes. Yes, Maharaj, so we see in, uh, like when uh, Lord performs uh, his Valya Lila, so that time uh, uh, to Yashoda Mata, he, uh, he shows the uh, uh, multiple times the whole cosmos, but uh, uh, but Mata Shoda Mata uh, want to stay in illusion because he want to treat the Lord as his son, and he always thought that this is because of uh, uh, some uh, negative energy that is affecting her. So she always always wanted to be, of course, covered by yoga Maya in order to, and that is what this Lord wanted to enjoy the. Uh, uh, motherly uh, love uh, and, and uh, that's the reason probably Lord has covered her with uh, yoga maya but here again this and same was the situation with Gopi. Gopis never accepted Lord as as uh, the uh, 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 supreme uh, 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 reality of Godhead but he always uh, treated him like though he is, they said it multiple times that he may be God, but for us he is uh, just uh, Nanda Nandan, uh, 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 and they wanted to be always immersed in the loving services. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to relate what you said to this verse, though. Uh, are you saying that the uh, the, the consciousness of the gopis and the consciousness of Mother Yasoda was was illusory under the influence of Yoga Maya? Yes, or Maharaj. We, were, because, in, uh, because moment you would have thought of that they are the uh, uh, Supreme Father, so they, uh, their relations would have been imme momentarily immediately changed, their behavior uh, would have changed. So they have been always under, uh, uh, because of yoga, uh, they never treated that is the uh, Supreme Father. And they always love to treat uh, them as a, a small child. 
and that is what the lord also wanted so sometime this uh, lord deliberately want uh, to very sincere devotees or eternal associates that there should not be in a consciousness that uh, the, uh, that he is the uh, lord himself and so that he can enjoy the different mellows okay that but th that's a very special consciousness you see that that kind of consciousness where, where it's the, the illusion the, the 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 consciousness of mother yashoda and the gopis their consciousness you could say under yoga maya there's some kind of illusion there they're seeing krishna as their lover or as their son so yeah that that is that is full consciousness so that's they've come to that position by the result of all their well they're because they're perfect they're perfect devotees they're not ordinary they're not mixed devotees they're pure devotees so they have full consciousness so that consciousness in loving krishna is certainly better than the long life of illusion the life of the materialist, the materialistic people who, you know, there were so many people, they also saw Krishna, but they could not understand Krishna as the Supreme Lord. And we saw, we saw different demons, how they came and they challenged Krishna. So Prabhu is making the point that the gopis, mother Yashoda, they had full consciousness and they could relish the highest rasa with Krishna. But the materialists, they come to Krishna, they come to Krishna and they challenge Krishna. Like it was, was it Pundraka? He came to Krishna, he told Krishna that I'm the Supreme Lord. You should give that Sudarshan chakra to me. I'm God. So Krishna gave him Sudarshan Chakra, he cut off his head with it. Demons, did long life of illusion, demons like Sishupal and Dantavakra, they were uh, always envious of Krishna, challenging Krishna. So the long life of illusion. Kamsa course was an illusion he always wanted to kill Krishna but the devotees even if they just have a moment what is some scriptural evidence about that any verses from the scriptures Yes, there's one verse in the Bhagavad Gita, a little advancement made. Yes, what's the verse? Translation. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution, and a little advancement made saves us from the greatest danger. So, even a moment of full con a little advancement, svopam apyasya dharmasya. Yes? Yes, so it's got their hands up here. Duty Gopi, you got your hand up here for this? Um, yes, Maharaj. Um, I just wanted to give the example of Narad Muni. Like, he just saw Lord for a tiny second, you know, just a fraction of a second, and he 
got that moment of self realization and he realized what he has missed upon like earlier he was searching for uh, this like basically the lord and once when just for a tiny fraction of second he got darshans of the lord with maya and that's when he started crying and he developed that taste urge to see lord again and again so just it was just a moment of full consciousness which you know covered his change transformed his whole life just seeing the lord and then he wanted to see him more often yes right yes that was before he became narada muni yes when he was a little boy right okay thank you yes and diksha ahuja prabhu Diksha Prabhu has got his hand up. No response. Chaitanya Hari Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, can we take the example of Ajamina, where he wasted his whole life and at the last moment uh, he has some, uh, not full consciousness, but some, rim, some uh, he, he is able to chant the name of the Lord. Can we take that as an as example here? Okay, yes. Yes, okay, do you chant the name of the Lord? At the end of, of course, he'd been chanting throughout his life, actually. He didn't just only chant at the end of his life, but he'd been chanting regularly. He'd been chanting the name of his son constantly. All right. But he chanted the name of the Lord many times, although he never thought he was chanting the name. It was always... Um, and Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj in 7.30 Bhagavad Gita, it is mentioned that those in full consciousness of me who know me, the Supreme Lord, to be the governing principle of the material manifestation of the demigods and of all methods of sacrifice can understand and know me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even at the time of death. Okay. I was thinking also the verse about Sadhu Sangha, it says Lava Matra Sadhu Sangi Sarvas. Just a moment, even a fraction of a second, one eleventh of a second, Lava Matra. But it's enough to get perfection with the association with the devotees. Yes, and um, the Prabhu uh, Bhak, uh, Bhakta. Uh, Maharaja said, back to Prem Swami. Uh, Maharaj, uh, King Kulushekar. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Krishna, Todiya, Pada, Pankaja, Panjarantam, Paddeme, Vishutu, Manasha, Rajahamsha, Prana, Prana, Shamaya, Kavavata, Pittai, Pantava, Rajana, Vidu, Sarana, So, what's Maharaj Kadvanga saying? My Lord, yeah, Shabar Kulishakar saying, My Lord Krishna, I pray that oh, my, my mind to sink now today. If I live long time, we are unable to remember at the time of death, but at least I can remember now. This moment, one moment is enough. Mm. Ah, right. So this supports this statement, right? Katvanga said, no need to live a long time. Let me die now while I can still chant. Also, you can see practical life. The Prabhupada got little association of his speech of Masha Bhakti Siddhanta Shatashati Shakur. But so many other people got a lot of association. But Prabhupada took a lot of advantage of his spiritual master association. Uh -huh. Yes. Association. Thank you. Okay, then then Prabhu also has his some yes. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. So I was thinking about the example of Bharat Maharaj, you know, who who for a momentarily lo lost his uh, focus from bhakti and had to spend a life of uh, uh, full deer, you know. So contrary, but uh, you know, bit of contrary to the statement, but uh, you know, kind of emphasizing how staying attentive all the time to Devotional service is important. So we don't have to waste our life in full occupation. 
Bharat Maharaj example, I was thinking about maybe we can, you can enlighten more on this. Can we consider this? You mean Bharat Maharaj when he's Jad Bharat or when he was in the Gand upper the was, Yeah, when he got uh, illusioned by the deer, you know, so, so he has spent a life of devotional service. He has reached to the Bhava stage, but then just because he got inattentive to that because of the deer's association, and then his fall down happened. You know, it was a little kind of a momentary, uh, kind of, I don't know, momentary, but it was for a short period. He was having a life of devotional service, but for a short moment, he lost his attention and then he had to take a birth as a deer. You know, and then he had to spend the entire life of deer, which we consider as, uh, you know, uh, Jad life, uh, uh, kind of life of illusion. Although he was in consciousness, by the mercy of the Lord. So, but he had to stay in the life of a deer. And then in the next life, he become Jad Bharata again to revive his Krishna consciousness. Yes, yeah, it's a warning. How careful we have to be not to get distracted. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Good. Someone else has got a hand up here. This is. Yes, Maharaj, can, yes, Maharaj, can you take the example of the Murari in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita? The Murari, he was uh, he was killing the animals, he was half killing them, and he was taking pleasure in that. And when he got association of uh, Narnamuni, uh, he became a devotee. Yes. Okay, so a moment's association, a little association with Narada Muni changed him, got him to give up all his sinful activities and bad habits. Okay, wait. Just to finish off this section on dealing with blasphemy, here's some points. There are three ways of dealing with such insults. If someone in hearing is heard blaspheming by words, one should be so expert that he can defeat the opposing party by argument. If he is unable to defeat the opposing party, then the next step is that he should not just stand there meekly, but should give up his life. And the third process is followed if he is unable to execute the above mentioned two processes, and that is one must leave the place and go away. If a devotee does not follow any of the above mentioned three processes, he falls down from his position of devotee. That is from the Nectar of Devotion, chapter 9. So, of course, we want to learn to leave if there's some blasphemy going on. You don't want to hear it. And we don't want to encourage people with blasphemy. If nobody's around, then they'll be quiet. They have nobody to talk to. If we stay and listen to them, then they talk blasphemy. Then we're guilty also. We become culpable. We, become, we have to take some reaction because we're hearing the blasphemy. So don't allow yourself to hear, run away, people talking blasphemy. And offending devotees, that's the most serious, the first offense, right? To blaspheme devotees. Who are you offending? What is causing you to make offensive, offensive? What is causing you to make offenses or be critical of this devotee? What attitude must you adopt to stop being critical? What must you change within yourself to adopt these proper attitudes? Right? Who are you offending? Well, who are we offending? Offending devotees? Well, sometimes we think, oh, he's not really a devotee. I'm a devotee, but he's not a devotee. So that is very bad to have that mentality that we minimize the position of others, we criticize them, we say they're not devotees. 
What is causing us to make offenses or be critical of the devotee? Often what's causing us is simply envy, our own envious attitude, that we're jealous or envious of someone, that they've done something which we don't like, and, or we, we envy that they're doing something we wanted to do. They're doing better than us, and we criticize them, we try to pull them down. What attitude must you adopt to stop being critical? Well, we have to be repentant. We have to, first of all, understand that it's not good to criticize devotees. That's the first thing. And we have to understand that by criticizing devotees, it's causing great harm to our own devotion. And what do we have to change within ourselves to adopt these proper attitudes? We have to change the heart. We have to look at our own self and see the faults in ourself, not see the faults in others. Try to be critical of our own self rather than being critical of others. This is the idea. But certainly very serious, very harmful. In what way can we offend devotees if we criticize them by, on the basis of their birth or we criticize them on the basis of something they did before they were devotees? Or we criticize them on something which they did a long time ago when before they had any, uh, you know, maybe they did something just by chance, uh, un unknowingly, without proper thinking, they did something. So if we criticize people on that basis, then that's an offense. So. We, we have to be very careful not to criticize devotees. It's very serious. And Lord Chaitanya spoke about this a lot. So be very conscious not to offend devotees. And as we heard today, Maharaj said, how to avoid offending devotees? Appreciate them and glorify them and see the good in them. That is how we can avoid offending devotees. The conclusion is that one should neither hear nor allow vilification of a devotee of the Lord. From the purport of 12th verse. All right, we're going to stop here today. Are there any questions or comments? So today we spoke about Okay, yes. Okay, just now you give that three way of uh, how to avoid from uh, involving in lessening the devotees. Uh, sometime uh, we, we we face situation where uh, we are trying to uh, get and give association to some devotees who are gone through a difficult situation, but they are still uh, uh, indulging in that uh, things happen many years back, how to avoid so that at the same time we are not going to I mean, try to engage them back in our devotional life or engage back in ISKCON, for example. Sometimes they are in retweet, sometimes they are being, they get they already like frustrated with so many things. So how to, uh, we, we, we don't want to hear the blessing, but they, they are still have that mentality, Maharaj. Well, you have to overcome that by simply hearing and chanting, by having a strong program of Krishna Kata, having kirtan, nice kirtan, a lot of kirtan, and also classes, reading from the scriptures and discussing the philosophy, these things only. This is the process to help people get over these things which are there in their heart. Because people are not hearing and chanting, so they have these things in their heart. So you, you want to help them, the best help you can give them is to give them a Krishna conscious atmosphere and get them to start hearing and chanting, help them to get a taste for the holy name. If they can get some taste for the holy name, or if they can get some interest in the philosophy, then they can give up all these things, all these uh, things which are there in their heart from the past. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj.
this is a, this hearing and chanting is a real medicine for the disease of material conditioned life. And so the more we propagate the spiritual sound vibration, the holy name, good kirtan, and then reading the scriptures together and discussing it, I'll let them hear about Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's life, activities, or different acharyas, somehow or other get them absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Because the fact that they're, they've got these doubts, these problems in their mind, this is because they're on the bodily platform. You have to bring them off the bodily platform. You have to give them Krishna consciousness. So the pure spiritual atmosphere is very important. You want to help people come into Krishna consciousness, you've got to have that nice atmosphere. Nice kirtan and then nice prasadam also, giving them also very nice tasty prasadam. It's very important. That can really help people a lot to change their hearts. So these, these are loving exchanges. And the more you have loving exchanges with these devotees, then the more they can overcome these kind of tendencies. And so you have to be willing to reach out to them. Yeah. Make Thank nice you. arrangements. Sometimes also you can honor them, you know, give them flower garlands, you know, put a flower garland around their neck and, you know, let them feel wanted, feel appreciated. Mm. You will always get people coming, have, they have some problems, they have some doubts, they have something from the past, they didn't like something. Okay, okay, but if they have, a, if you have the strong Krishna conscious program, it can all be forgotten about. Yes, Maharaj, I'm trying to get them to come even to Mayapur, get some association. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, association is very important. All right, if there's no more questions, then we'll meet tomorrow and we'll go on with the rest of this chapter. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So can we also have the uh, these slides so that... Uh... Yes, uh, you can have them. When we're finished, when I go yes. through the class, then you can have them. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Thank you. Hare Krishna. All right. So I'll meet you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Ki Jai. Gorbhaka Vrinda. Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Ki Jai.